I'd like to begin, obviously, by acknowledging that we meet on Wajak Noongar land, and uh, the Wajak people are the traditional custodians of this land. I pay my respect to their elders past and present in the knowledge that where we meet and where we will build the new museum was in deep history a, a wetland of great significance to Wajak people. 20 minutes is not long to speak on what I consider to be one of the um, most fundamental questions facing museums today, what and how we should collect, and more importantly, why. Uh, th this engraving is the earliest pictorial record of a natural history cabinet and probably of a museum, and will be familiar to many of you. It's an engraving of Ferrante Imperato's Dell'Historia Naturale in Naples in 1599. Now that's what I call a museum. It's a collection of, well, just about anything uh, that might have been living at some point, but certainly wasn't by the time it made its way into the museum. It's tempting to think that we've moved on from this rather eclectic approach, but the beautiful and extremely successful uh, remodeling of Kelvin Grove Museum in Glasgow, in Scotland, uh, which I may say is one of the most visited museums in the UK outside London, took almost exactly the same approach, a cacophony of all kinds of things, uh, particularly at the Spitfire uh, swooping over the giraffe there, I'm not sure. People love it. Um, and at the risk of boring my colleagues who've seen this many times before, um, uh, a little uh, reminder of where we've come to in terms of developing the new museum here. Uh, this is the way we were. This was the Mammal Gallery about 100 years ago. And... Uh, that was the Mammal Gallery about um, two weeks ago. Uh, and uh, if you take the kind of uh, color out of it, it doesn't look terribly different. Um, I should say uh, we have moved on now because it's just been pulled out in preparation for the, uh, the new museum literally last week. But uh, it illustrates a really important point. It's one that's known to anybody in business that uh, is, you know, if you keep doing the same thing, don't expect to get a different answer. And I think the same thing is with collecting. If you keep collecting the same things, don't expect that you're going to change the way that you approach uh, your display. Of course, uh, one of the greatest challenges facing us is uh, how to develop a credible digital strategy. Uh, there's a touchingly naive view among some that this is the answer to everything. It is not. Uh, it provides an answer to some things, uh, but also many more questions. I remember distinctly in the early days of discussion with Treasury, and I do know this is being filmed, by the way, um, the, the comments from the Treasury saying, well, why would you need a museum? Because everything's digital now. So uh, it's quite good to be uh, closing the museum for development with some of the most extraordinary objects in the world. Now, according to ICOM, the International Council of Museums, a museum is a non-profit permanent institution in the service of society and its development, open to the public, which acquires, conserves, researches, communicates, and exhibits the tangible and intangible heritage of humanity and its environment for the purposes of education, study, and enjoyment. Uh, am I bothered? Um, not really. Um, but I would like to just dissect that uh, in uh, one way in terms of how the WA Museum matches up, but also, hopefully, uh, how it goes beyond that. Is it non-profit? Well, no, uh, no problem there. I can guarantee we're non-profit. <laughs> Um, uh, are we a permanent institution? Let's hope so. Uh, in the service of society and its development, can't argue with that. Open to the public, of course. Well, that's good. Um, acquires, conserves, um, absolutely. So we're, you know, five down. Tangible, uh, untangible heritage. Uh, just don't get me started on that one because I actually uh, have a, a particular and personal um, problem with the term intangible heritage, which I might talk about in, the, in a few moments. Um, humanity and its environment, that's a bit of an anthropo anthropomorphic view of the world, I feel, and something that we might want to uh, take into account. And uh, yes, it does education, study, and enjoyment, but it should do so much more as well. At the risk of sounding self-righteous, the WA Museum is less concerned with what a museum is uh, than what it does. Uh, I remember some years ago when I worked in the UK, we had a national program of funding for regional museums called Renaissance in the Regions. Its strapline was Museums for Changing Lives, and that is what I believe museums should do. It should also drive our collecting imperatives. With this in mind, we developed a mission statement, uh, which I think describes exactly what we should do, inspire people to explore and share their identity, culture, environment, and sense of, of place, and contribute to the diversity and creativity of our world. It's not a sanctimonious and vanilla statement, but an articulation of our values and an essential commitment to change across the whole organization, not because it was broken or dysfunctional, but because not enough people understood what it was for or what it could do. And as James has said, uh, we are building a new museum right here, right now, 
Uh, it's been a long time coming, and even now we cannot show you a picture of what it will look like. Uh, give me four months and we might be able to. Uh, but for now, this nebulous image of flensed marine mammals floating through the ether as visitors in suits dice with death on unprotected balconies is, I'm afraid, the best, best that I can, uh, can offer you. Um, luckily, we've already completed two phases of this $430 million project. Um, refurbishment of the heritage buildings here, the exteriors, uh, but, but also the very exciting completion of new stores and laboratories at our collection research center in Welshpool. And uh, my curators are absolutely over the moon about, you know, people get excited about different things and they love kind of roller racking like this, compactus. So uh, uh, this latter achievement is critical to the success, the development of the museum because it is home to the vast majority of the 8.5 million items uh, in the WA Museum's collections that span many disciplines of culture and communities and the natural sciences. A collection of real things is surely what defines a museum, or it should be. Certainly for the new project, one of our touchstones has been authenticity, uh, but that authenticity does not necessarily mean physical things. It can mean many other things as well. It's worth remembering that the breadth of collections and activity of the WA Museum and of those, uh, is that those real things are not all the result of human activity. Uh, those compact to shelving units and that store is for just a small proportion of our zoological collections uh, that at least in number dwarf the numbers of our culture and community collections. Uh, but they're extremely important to helping us understand uh, and manage and indeed conserve our environment. These biological collections have many contemporary uses, and many, I suspect, that we still do not know of. They provide environmental data, cultural data, and in the case of the Western rock lobster here, a reference point for those who think they may have been sold something less than authentic. We get a lot of queries around that. Um, the potential for biological material that we retain is limitless. Our molecular laboratory is currently used for identifying organisms and sorting out evolutionary relationships. But who knows in the future whether or not under appropriate ethical conditions we will be able to uh, recreate extinct species like the Tasmanian tiger. And the power of objects is beyond question. Extreme examples in our collection include the Second World War prison camp suit in which a Polish migrant arrived here in Western Australia, these the only clothes and possessions that he had at the time. And if we're talking about the power of objects, we had to get Neil McGregor in somewhere. And uh, this is my favorite ever photograph of museum cultural diplomacy. Uh, Neil McGregor in Tehran uh, showing the Cyrus cylinder from the BM's collections uh, to the then Iranian president, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. Uh, Ahmadinejad was not the most sympathetic person to Western causes, it has to be said. And uh, when the British Museum lent this object, uh, it created a dialogue that could never have been created by any other aspect of the British um, uh, government at that time. And I think, uh, Matt, in terms of your political dimensions, that was an extreme one. One of the key questions, of course, is how to collect and indeed present Aboriginal cultural materials and the first answer to that, of course, is working closely with Aboriginal people. And this is one of those clear cases where it's not always appropriate to collect the actual material. This, by the way, of course, is some of the rock art on the Burrup Peninsula, um, something that with only a touch of hyperbole I describe as a, a kind of human chronicle over just about geological time. It's one of the most extraordinary places in the world. So much Aboriginal culture is based upon oral tradition, and for that reason, we collect stories, testimonies, and memories. These are equally authentic to the physical objects, and this is where I have that argument with the prejudicial term, intangible cultural heritage. Intangible is a Western term that really reveals our own uh, lack of understanding of those cultural paradigms. How can you imagine something more tangible to an Aboriginal person than the dreaming story that might define their very being? And I have to say, it's an intangible cultural heritage is a term I'm trying to uh, uh, dispense with at every, every turn. The next stage beyond that is creating authentic, contemporary, and non-physical Aboriginal cultural expression. And this is why we work here at the WA Museum so closely with Aboriginal co uh, performance company, Yiri Yakin. Uh, this year, we'll be commissioning a new, year, new work by Yiri Yakin called Bujikatajin uh, about the love and understanding of country that will actually tour regional WA. And in this sense, what could be more relevant uh, than our object 101? 
uh, and the relationship between traditional knowledge and contemporary Western science. This leads into a more general consideration of contemporary collecting. How do we know what we should collect today? What will be important to help future generations understand us? SAMDOC was an initiative that began in Sweden in 1973 with its uh, purpose was, and I quote, preservation of an optimal stock of objects for the future and furnishing objects with the necessary peripheral, peripheral information. I think we call that metadata today, don't we? Uh, in 1973, the organization was made up of five national and regional museums which would rotate responsibility for collecting each year. Researchers at each institution would choose a family that they felt was representative of an area uh, and carefully document their living spaces with photographs, usually focusing on one room. And after in situ documentation, uh, the researchers would attempt to acquire as many of the objects from that room as the family was willing to donate. That kind of gives you an interesting thought of, it's a bit like the bailiffs coming in, isn't it, really? But, uh, um, and oral histories were recorded. Uh, it's a really interesting project. It actually wrapped up in 2011, but it was certainly the museum sector followed it through with great interest because we all struggle with this idea of what do we collect today. But it also demonstrates another point that's come up several times today, this issue of um, um, sub, you know, objectivity in museums. There is no such thing as objectivity. Someone is always making a choice. Someone's always deciding what to collect, what to display, how to interpret it. So we shouldn't fool ourselves on that one. Um, and I suppose the other thing that we also, and uh, that little cartoon which came from one of the SAMDOC pub uh, publications is how we then communicate that idea that it is important to collect today because we still obviously get people coming to the museum so why are you collecting that? You know, I used to have one of those. Well, that's why we collected it, actually. Um, I must admit, the other issue of, of, of SAMDOC is, you know, if you were one of those families being tracked, you know, would it affect the way you lived your life? Would you actually buy healthier food than you might otherwise have bought? You know, would you have uh, you ordered those kind of uh, marital aids on the internet that uh, you were uh, saving up for if you uh, knew that somebody was going to document it and put it in a museum for perpetuity? In perpetuity? I suspect not. So where I was actually going with this, um, uh, there's a, a slide missing out of here, but was uh, actually showing uh, the museum in Western Park in Sheffield. Uh, in Yorkshire, in England, uh, where there's a gallery, which is called Your Gallery, and that's where you create your own, um, you know, your own memories, your own messages. Uh, and I also had, which is very relevant to the, uh, Perth, in, uh, the uh, Perth International Arts Festival this year, uh, something called Street Skate Style, which was the, my favorite ever um, uh, project that I did in Newcastle upon Time, which is working with uh, 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 skaters, uh, you know, with skateboards in Newcastle to create a collection based around their lives, their equipment, their costume, to form a permanent uh, record of that. There's another uh, dimension that is to well, the, the idea of museums creating uh, collections almost, uh, I suppose, by, uh, um, by subterfuge. These are two installations, again, in two, one in Kelvin Grove on the, the left and one in Bristol on the right, where art interventions, they're not they weren't actually technically uh, artistic interventions, but they were interventions to really create a, a sense and a space uh, that epitomized the place. So for instance, Bristol with the balloons, uh, lots of people go hot air ballooning in Bristol, and it's a very common sight on the, the skyline. Uh, Glasgow, those faces, the very famous hanging faces to create expressions of all the different people uh, of, of Glasgow. But when those museums change their displays, are they going to keep those as collections? And in a sense, does that mean the museum has, has intervened uh, unfairly? I don't know. I also found this blog, which I thought captured a particularly Australian element. Um, and uh, this was uh, where thongs were being washed up on Chile Beach um, in Queensland. And the blog from Dr. Joe Wills here says, could some of the thongs collected during the annual cleanup be considered significant and included in contemporary collections uh, and stories about tourism, environmental management, and community on eastern uh, Cape York Peninsula? Now there is, I'm back onto Doctor Who for some reason, um, one of the ways that we can actually engage with um, collectors uh, or collections is to work with uh, personal collections and personal collectors. Uh, but there are, of course, uh, some uh, dangers in this. You sometimes uh, you might end up with uh, working with someone like Rob Hull, 
who has 1,202 Daleks, apparently. Um, apparently he's not even interested in Doctor Who. Uh, Nick Vermeulen of the Netherlands has 6,290 airsick bags from 1,191 uh, different airlines. That must be a lot of air miles. And uh, bring it back to home, I'm not particularly sure that I would want to uh, give space to um, uh, Australian Graham Barker, who's been uh, collecting his own belly fluff since 1984 and apparently has the largest collection in the world, surprisingly enough, but uh, there you go. Uh, I know what you're thinking, they're all mad and they're all men, but uh, uh, meet Nancy Hoffman from uh, Peaks Island, Maine, who owns the largest umbrella cover collection in the world, and if you visit the museum, she will greet you by playing her official song on, your, on her accordion, so uh, watch out for that one. The v &A ran a very interesting um, project uh, called Every Object Tells a Story, uh, some years ago, which involved dispatching a London taxi with a vid video booth installed uh, to all corners of the United Kingdom. And people went along and brought along an object of particular importance to them and made a, a video digital record of that. And that, again, was a collection in perpetuity. The museum didn't acquire the objects, but it actually uh, acquired the stories around them. Uh, that was my object, by the way. Um, We've talked a lot about emotions. We're also running out of time, and I'm going to get a cling on the glass any minute. But the, um, uh, this was uh, something that was brought when we did a, a 70th anniversary of the sinking of HMS Sydney uh, seminar in Geraldton. And uh, this is uh, an absolutely extraordinary object, but I'm not going to tell you about it. You have to ask me about it afterwards, because otherwise I'm going to lose my time. Uh, Our uh, own scale Dan version of uh, capturing digital stories Somewhere, no doubt in a minute, a slide will come up of the Library of Congress when it announced that it was going to take a big stride towards preserving uh, the US's uh, increasingly dig digital heritage by acquiring Twitter's entire archive of tweets. That was in 2010, they said they were going to do that. Um, more than five years later, the project is in limbo and the library is still grappling with how to manage an archive that amounts to something like half a million tweets. Uh, our own scaled down version of that uh, is called WA Faces. It involves people making uh, and providing a portrait of themselves and their opinions of what makes WA. And this is a live project. We've done a lot of face-to-face -face work on this, but it's also online and people can actually uh, make their own, um, uh, their own video online. And we've now, I think, got about 3,000 of these, which will all be part of the story of the new museum. There can be Few more provocations than the display of this vessel, uh, the refugee and asylum seekers vessel that arrived in Geraldton in tw uh, 2013. Uh, but that is exactly what we want to do in the new museum uh, that will be built here. It'll provide uh, an opportunity to build understanding of the plight of refugees, of the political hysteria around this issue, and of an Australian psyche at the time that I found particularly spiteful. But it will also provoke, to say the least, energetic debate about the fate and the treatment of refugees and asylum seekers in Australia. And this isn't alien to museums. This is a display in Bristol that opened a few years ago, which was, when does violence become a justifiable course of action? We were looking at the history of the uh, uh, nu nuclear disarmament movement in the UK. This is uh, Pukia Riki uh, in New Plymouth in New Zealand, where they held uh, this exhibition uh, called What If? where people, again, contributed their own views uh, about New Plymouth, which very much actually affected the way that New Plymouth developed uh, thereafter. And this, I think, is quite brilliant, uh, appearing here as part of the fringe. Uh, this is uh, called, as it says there, A Mile in My Shoes, and it's something run by the Empathy Museum out of the UK, where visitors are invited to walk a mile in somebody else's shoes. And that person might be anything from, a, it says yeah, a sewer worker or a sex worker even, and to really uncover the stories, the different aspects of life, loss, grief, hope that those people have. And I think that experiential and emotional experience is really interesting. If you get a chance to, to check that out, please do. So I had a little checklist at the end of how the nature of collecting, I think, is changing. We're collecting more commonplace. Um, you know, we previously collected the rare and the wonderful. We're now trying to collect the representative. In the biological sciences, it's more molecular. We don't actually need to collect as much material now because that information is tied up in molecular uh, data. More digital, more personal, more personal objects, and as I say, more representative, maybe. Um, more ephemeral, 
and more, a bit of a typo there, opinion driven. Uh, it's less expensive. I so one of the issues that uh, really affects museums or public museums today is their inability to cope uh, and, and actually compete in markets with private collectors. Uh, it's less curated, and in a way, maybe that could be a good thing. It means that it's uh, more, I guess, what people think from their heart. Uh, it's less physical. There's more of those non-physical that I won't call intangible um, uh, cultural items. It's less fact-driven, and there's definitely less bling. Uh, and one of the issues that we have to cope with, and that illustrated very much by that library example, is it's less manageable. We've got so much data that we can collect these days. We really have to be very focused uh, about uh, the way we go about it. Um, and so I guess the, the postscript to that is what you know, people, or indeed things, will think of us in the future, because that's the real challenge of uh, collecting uh, for us. Uh, we you know, might think of how we want to be seen today, but we have no idea what future generations uh, will think uh, from the museum collections of today. Thank you very much. Thank you.